for a meaningful life and conscious living. Join our discussions about the mundane, our daily activities, and then infuse every day with a spiritual twist from the inspired sages of the Talmud and Jewish mysticism, which many call Kabbalah. We learn from the root source of all religious monotheistic traditions and delve into the symbolism and levels of meaning from biblical stories. A very good morning to all of our audience listening on live. We're so happy that you are joining us today. And if you have any questions or comments or just in general, let us know that you're listening. That'll be great. Just uh, chat with us and let us know you are listening and you are enjoying the class. That means a lot to us. A special thanks to Nissan Communications for doing this week after week and allowing so many people all over the world to benefit from our study sessions held right here at Chabad of Kerry in Cary, North Carolina. If you do support the work that Nissan Communications is doing, please, please donate to their website. You will see a donate button on the home page. Today we're going to visit, for me, probably one of the saddest stories in Torah. And you can say there are a lot of sad stories. There's the flood that wipes out the world. <laughs> There's the golden calf. This might not have been the saddest in terms of, of loss of life to many people people. But if you think about Moshe's entire life, you know, he, he, Moses is charged with this mission to take the Jews out of Egypt and bring them to the promised land. And his whole life is dedicated to that. He has no personal life. As we said last week, his very existence is tied with his people. That was his life. And because of one little miscue in this week's Torah portion, he's not allowed entry into the land of Israel. And you think about everything he has done. And we got to appreciate just how much Israel meant to him. It wasn't just, you know, a nice place and good scenery. He saw that as a place where he can finally fulfill, I guess, the mitzvot in their most spiritual form. He can live a Jewish life the way it should be lived. His entire life was to get there. And to get that far, but not allowed entry, that just breaks my heart every single time. I Good to see you, Edith. Every single time I read the story, every single year, you think, Rabbi, I already know what's going to happen from last year, right? You don't get sad again. I do get sad. I read God telling Moshe, you're not allowed to go into the land of Israel because of this story that we'll read about, a well-known story. And it just breaks my heart every single year. And we've got to try to understand that. You know, there's a lot we don't understand. Every week we touch in some way why bad things happen to good people, and there's so much that we don't have answers to. But in this case, it's a little bit different, because God specifically tells us in the Torah, Moshe, this is why you're not going in. It's not a mystery. So that's when we have the question, is there no mercy? Is the margin of error so little? Was the offense that bad that warranted such a strict punishment? Why was it that Moshe was not allowed entry into the land of Israel, just to sort of open the stage here. One of the commentators words it this way. He's so bothered, so troubled every single year when he words, when he reads these verses in the Torah, he writes, text number one, we're on 226. Stage is set for Moses to go into the land of Israel is not allowed. How? Read the way this, this person <laughs> words it, Rabbi Yitzchak Arama. Words it this way. The table, <coughs> the meat, and the knife are all here before us, but we have no mouth with which to eat. God's commandment to Moses is written before us. The act that was done is not lost before our eyes. Yet from God's wrath, our hearts are shot. We know of no interpretation that could soften the blow of reading these verses. Yeah. All ready to go into Israel, and boom, gotcha, can't go in. Um, and... and as we'll see in a moment, what do the verses say he did wrong, and how is that understood? There's one commentator that brings, ready for this, 13 different perspectives on what he did wrong. <laughs> 13 different perspectives, because the verses are not clear, and he says, you want to know? And he sort of summarizes all the other opinions. 13, we're going to do about three or four of those 13 today. We're not, yeah, we're not here that long. I'm not going to push it. No, no. no. But it's bothersome. And I, you think, I think about how much Moshe did for the people. And this is the one thing he sort of wanted for himself. 
not not in an egotistical way, like I want to go see Hawaii. It wasn't that kind of I need to go see Israel. He didn't want to go see the Dead Sea. He didn't want to go see, you know, the sites. He wanted to be able to live in the spiritual atmosphere of the land of Israel and do mitzvot that could only be done in Israel. Um, there's certain mitzvot that can't be done elsewhere. Even today, that's true. Like this year is a sabbatical year, a Shemitah year. If you're a farmer in Israel, you don't work this year, at least as a farmer. One year. Yeah, you can't. If you're a farmer here, you do work. So there's certain mitzvot that are only done in Israel, especially in biblical times. There were many agricultural mitzvot, um, tithings, and, and all sorts of charity and offerings going up for the holidays to Jerusalem. He wanted an opportunity to do this. His soul wanted the opportunity. Denied entry, as we'll read in a moment. How? In the introduction, you said something that God said to bring them to the land of Israel. He did bring them to the land of Israel. So I'm wondering when first God talked to him, if he used those words that you just said, that God said to bring them. That's what you said. I don't know if that's right. God told Moshe to tell the Jews that they will be going into the land of Israel. Um, I need to look back and see whether or not there is anywhere that does. That's a good question. Does God ever tell Moses in the introductory, it, it, when he assigns him the job, the job is to take the Jews out of Egypt. Does he say that you will be the one? You want to get a clinician? Do, do you mind getting one? Huh? Okay. Okay. In any event, the Parsha, before we get there, let's just set the stage. This week's tar portion is sad for another reason as well. You have you read about the passing of I don't want to say all three because Moshe doesn't pass away right away. God says you're going to pass away, but he doesn't actually pass away till the way end of the Torah. But Moshe's two siblings pass away in this week's parsha as well. Mm-hmm. So they have three siblings, and they were the leaders of the Jewish people: Moses, Aaron, Miriam. The midrash goes as far as to say that every time Pharaoh made a decree against the Jewish people, God said, "I'm going to give you a leader." in order to overpower this decree. Jersey, read 227. This is a Midrash. The verse states, I was not at ease, neither was I quiet, and I did not rest, yet trouble came. I was not at ease from the first degree of the Quran decreed on me, as it says, and they embittered their lives, and God appointed a redeemer, Miriam, on account of mirror bitterness. I was not quiet in the second decree of, if it is a son, you shall put him to death. And God appointed a redeemer named Aaron on account of Hirayon. I did not rest from the third degree of every son who is born you shall cast into the Nile. And God appointed a redeemer named Moses as it is written, from the water I drew him. So- the, Mishi, these three siblings were all brought into the world to uh, counterbalance an evil decree Pharaoh did. There's a nice lesson here, and that is God provides the cure for the problem. You know, when a problem happens, the cure is out there in the world. So God says you have a bitter life. I'm giving you Miriam. What does the word Miriam mean in Hebrew? What does it sound like? Which word? Maror that we have on Passover. And that was to counter the marorness of the exile. God told the midwives to kill the first, um, excuse me, the boys. Pregnancy and Aaron have a very similar word. And finally, throw the boys into the Nile. Of Moshe is called Moshe because it means from the water I drew him. These three leaders were the pillars of the Jewish people. And it says that the three gifts that the Jewish people had in the wilderness. What were the three things that kept them alive? Text 3, page 228. Um, Rabbi Yosi, son of Rabbi Yehuda, said three good patrons rose up for Israel. They were Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Three good gifts were given on their account, and they are the well, the cloud, and the manna. The well was in the merit of Miriam, the pillar of cloud in the merit of Aaron, and the manna in the merit of Moses. So these were the three gifts that really kept the Jews alive. They had their food for 40 years. They had the clouds. The clouds was what? Their GPS. <laughs> and also served as somewhat of a uh, protection. And that was Aaron and water. I mean, 40 years in the desert, you need water. 
And there was this Be'er Shel Miriam, this well of Miriam, they called it that, Miriam's well, that came with them miraculously throughout the entire trip. And the Torah says that was Beschusa Shel Miriam, that was in her merit. Why do you think Miriam was given the merit of the well? Any, any guess? Why Miriam the well? Put um, the water with Moses being born. She stood by the water when Moses was born, protecting him, making, sh- watching him, remember? Because the mom put him in the river, and Miriam went to see what would happen, and she was the one that stayed with him. She was the one that later told Batya, go find a Jewish uh, uh, woman to nurse him. So since she stood there with the water, she was rewarded, and the Jewish people later got water through her. Wouldn't she be so old, though? I mean, if, if she was able to watch Moses. She was a born. child then, and how many years later was it? Yeah, these. she was a child then. Moses, how old was Moses when he led the Jews out of Egypt? An old man. 80. He was 80. Do we know that? Moses was 80 years old. How do we know that? Because how many years were the Jews in the wilderness? 40. How old was Moses when he passed away? 120. 120, 120, the Torah says. And that became sort of the number we say that most people don't make it to, even until today. 120 is like, right, you always have the Guinness Book of World Records, 117, 118, 114, right? What is it usually? Yeah, that 120 marker is kind of... Oh, yeah. yeah. In any event, Moshe passed away at 120, but most of his career happened in the latter two-thirds. Right. From 80 to 120. Miriam was a few years older than Moshe. I always thought of her as being a little older than that. More than a few years. She's, she's, how many years? She's been the person so responsible. I mean, even if she was a child when she stood over him. Right. She's, 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 correct. There is somewhere in the Torah where it says the differences in their ages. I don't know it all. It's, it's a number. I don't know if it's 10 or 15 or 8 or something like that. It's out there. She's an old woman as well. She's the oldest. Miriam is the oldest. Then comes Aharon. Then comes Moshe. Now, why is this important to our topic? Because in this week's Torah portion, page 230, uh, 6a, what do we read about? Mind reading? Yeah. The entire congregation of the children of Israel arrived at the desert of Zin in the first month, and the people settled in Kadash. Miriam died there, was buried there. The congregation had no water, so they assembled against Moses and Aaron. This is a, a good one second. I'll hold you there for a moment. Here's a good example of how Midrash works. Look at the verses again. There's, it says two things happened. She passed away, they ran out of water. Uh, what's the connection between the two? They had water all these years. What happened now? She's so, dried it right up. Correct. But without the oral tradition that the well was in her mirror, we wouldn't understand this. But this is typical where there's an oral tradition, but there's an also part of scriptures that backs that up. It's not just an oral tradition. The fact that there's an association between Miriam and the water is seen clearly in this verse. The oral tradition just spells it out for us. Everyone get that? that that's an important idea. And anyway, keep on going. The people quarreled with Moses, and they said, If only we had died with the death of our brothers before God. Why have you brought the congregation of God to this desert so that we and our livestock should die there? All right, so you can imagine the the, the, the panic that broke out. Hundreds of thousands of people in the middle of a desert with no water. That's, that's That's pretty rough. And I think we can all say that this kvetching is a little bit different than other kvetching. You know, it's one thing for the Jewish people to be complaining about what, where's the beef, right? right. Or, you know, it's taking too long. Asking for water, I mean, I know, they, the way they said it could have been better. Oh, you brought us out in order that we should die over here. That's where you see where uh, cynicism comes from and whatnot, right? right. And I'm totally unreasonable. Why would they accuse him of knowing Correct. something that could not be known? Right. And, oh, and all these other miracles until now were, were, were for nothing. Uh, yeah. But we can understand that people are very thirsty and they're in the desert. It doesn't bring out the best in them. I, I think, you know, we can understand that. Um, so she passed away. And you see 6B, the oral tradition makes this connection. As soon as she passed away, the well dried up. And it's at that point where... God instructs Moshe, find this rock, and I'm going to, because of time, we're going to go a little bit faster, 
And all it says in the verses, God tells Moshe to speak to the rock. <coughs> and after Moshe speaks to the rock, water will come out. And the verse says that Moshe took his staff. What did he do? He struck the rock. And actually the verse says, Pa'amayim, he struck the rock twice. First is sort of a warning, it didn't work right away. Struck it a second time. And then the second time water came out. And right after that story is finished, here is the text, text 9, read please. God said to Moses and Aaron, since you do not have faith in me to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly to the land which I have given. These are the words of the Spirit. Right, in Hebrew, Meimiriva, right? Yeah. Where the children of Israel contended with God. He was sanctified. That's it. That's all that happened. God told Moshe to take. Interestingly enough, Ona, I don't know why they don't actually quote the verses here. It'd be good to see it. Let me just read the exact verses for you so you hear what he was told to do and hear what he did. 2012, I think. What page? 2012. Thanks. Rabbi, while you're looking at that, I'm going to ask you something. Sure. When it talks about that much water which drowned forever had rebelled, most of the people did rebel after he struck the stone a second time. Now, the rebel here, yeah. Midrash, right? Correct. Okay. Probably the ringleaders knows that uh, meant really bad. Okay, the verse says as follows. Hashem said to Moses saying, take the staff, gather together the assembly, you and your brother, Speak to the rock before their eyes that it shall give its water. You shall bring forth for them water from the rock and give the assembly to drink for them and their animals. Moshe took the staff before God. Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation before the rock and said, Listen, O rebels, do you think we can bring, do you think, shall we bring forth water from this rock? Then Moshe raised his arm and struck the rock with his staff twice. Lots of water came out, and they drank. Interestingly enough, God tells him to bring the staff. Did you notice that? But when he actually gets there, what should he do? Speak to it. That's the story. So, is it a gotcha moment? Ha, I got ya. <laughs> I told you to speak to it. Where's the justice over here? And interestingly enough, Aaron is also punished because Moshe and Aaron are both commanded to go together. Even though Moshe was the one that did it, Aaron stood by and allowed it, and he understood what the decree is well. Um, is it because of anger? I mean, I know it's because he used the staff. I mean, I thought that was... So that's going to be one of the 13 answers. Stand. One of the 13 answers is going to be the anger component. Let's get there in a moment. Um, skipping this next section... Let's now go to 236. So Rashi, the most basic of the commentators, basically says, what did he do wrong? He hit it instead of spoke to it. That's the most literal. He was supposed to speak to it, and he hit it instead. It would have been a bigger honor. Kiddush Hashem, sanctification of God's name. Greater miracle had the water come out just because of speaking. He lessened that, he hit it. Interestingly enough, how many times did he hit it? Twice. Why twice? Maybe the first time was a warning. This ain't what you're supposed to be doing, right? I heard a nice lesson as well, and that's whenever you use force instead of persuasion. Force. You always have to, it doesn't come natural. Never yields the results. And this was sort of the warning. So that's the way Rashi looks at it. He didn't follow the instruction. Since he struck it once, and a little water began to Correct. And then something's wrong. Boom. Yeah. He didn't pick up the cue that there was a problem over there. Okay. So let's do the 13 explanations, or at least a few of them. Are there any questions or comments from the online community, Amnon? No, not yet. Okay. And Debbie, if you are watching, please let us know. It would make us so happy to know if you are present and watching. <coughs> Okay, so what exactly was done wrong? Look at the way this commentator writes the text. 
11, Rabbi Shmuel David Lazato. Were you reading? Yeah. yeah. So, text 11, 236. Moses committed, a, committed one sin, and the commentary saddled him with 13 sins or more. As much I have abstained from delivering us into the matter for fear that I would arrive at a new interpretation, and I too would attribute a new sin to Moses, our teacher. <laughs> see, see what he's saying? He's like, I don't want to even begin here. Everyone is, is, is giving Moses more and more sins by explaining what he did wrong. I'm just going to remain silent over here. We don't need to give Moses more mistakes over here. Um, easy to criticize. Yeah, exactly. It's easy to see what must have been wrong. There is one opinion that says that it wasn't gotcha. It was that it was not about what he did now. This was just a pretense. Look at the words of the Abarbanel in text 12. How? Moses and Aaron were punished for the sins they did. For Aaron, it was the sin of the golden calf. And for Moses, a leader, it was the matter of the spies. This is not to say that Aaron was amongst those who served the golden calf or that Moses was the same as the spies, heaven forbid. Rather, Aaron, as explained in the context, constructed the calf with no negative intent. Moses' fault was that when the Jews asked him to send spies, they only asked, bring us back word by which route we shall go up. <coughs> Moses took the initiative to then add the task of seeing if the people who inhabited the land, are they strong or weak? Are there few or many? So he says each one had another problem. Aaron was a participant in some manner with the golden calf. He meant well. He meant just to delay. His involvement was hoping that Moses would come back. But at the end of the day, he was involved. Moshe, he was not the one who messed up with the spies. The Jewish people messed up by believing the report of the spies. That being said, Moshe sent them out and sort of tell me how strong they are. And, you know, and, and those words, the Barbanel writes, helped fuel the spies' negative report afterwards. Now, it was sort of already decided at that point that would be their punishment. Later, there had to be a pretense, this is what it is. Where does he get this from? Like, especially Aaron's, we understand, but Moses's, where, where, where does he pull this from? What is his support text in the Torah? that Moses' problem was with the spies. Is that a bold thing to say? Where does he get that from? So interestingly enough, if you look in Deuteronomy text 13a, and I'm going to just paraphrase this, when Moses recounts, in Deuteronomy, Moses recounts everything that happened up until now. And Moses talking about the story of the spies. You didn't want to go up. You rebelled against Hashem. And God heard your words. And God became angry. And he said that this whole generation will not go in. God was also angry at me because of you saying, neither will you go there. Everyone see that? So that seems to suggest that there is a correlation between the sin of the spies. And at that moment, God got angry at me as well. The deed wasn't, therefore, it was already somewhat determined that I wasn't going to go in. It was just a matter of what was going to be the final kicker. What was the final kicker? The hitting of the rock, but it was already determined it was... So at least according to the Barbanel, it was not the sin of hitting the rock itself. It was determined already beforehand. This was just a pretense. Um, that is one of 13. You mentioned and the anger. And we're going to have one commentator that says, that's going to be my mana. It often takes a very rational, understandable approach to it. When you read these verses, the tone that you can get is, Moses is getting angry at his people. Let's do Nach, uh, Maimonides, text 14. Do you mind where are we God, next? God said of the master of the early and latter ages, Moses our leader, since you did not have faith in me to sanctify me, Moses' sin was that he veered from that most important of character trait, patience. He veered to anger when he said, Listen, you rebels. God reasoned that when a man like Moses grows angry in front of the congregation of Israel in a place where anger is not justified, it cause, causes a desecration of his name. 
because everyone learns from all his words and actions. How could they witness such anger in him when it is one of the negative traits? When they saw that they had become angry, they said, He is certainly not prone to negative traits, if not for the fact that God himself is angry, that we demanded water, and when, and when and it is we who angered him, Moshe would not be angry. Yet, we do not find evidence of God being angry. He has simply said, Take your staff and gather the people. We have thus resolved one of the greatest conundrums of the Torah, about which much has been said, the question which has been asked repeatedly, what, what sin did Moshe do? So there are a few parts here. Number one is, we know we make mistakes when we get angry. Mm -hmm. We lose control. We lose control. And to be a Jew, to be a person, what is the power of being a person, mind over heart? That our intellect is in charge of our emotions. We don't act instinctively. We can be thoughtful in that which we do. And we lose the ability to do that when we are angry. And number one would be Moshe getting angry. How do we know he's angry? He says, Shimuna Mori. Mori means a, a rebel. He called them rebels over here. He gets angry at them. Do you really believe? Do you believe that water can come out, you rebels? He, he loses his anger. And, and for the Jewish people to see their great Moshe like this, that's not a great learning experience. He's still human. He's still human. That's true. That's true. And, and that's, you know, we could say, what, was his margin of error so little? Right. Well, are they saying that this also, he's representing God? And they're oh, and, and then they're saying, must be God's angry at us. In this case, God was not. And that's why I, I told you before, asking for water is not the same as the other fetching the Jews did. This was different. You're in the desert. It's a basic human need, you know, survival. And it's scary. It's kind of scary. God demand, you know, the bar wasn't that high of us to expect us just to be sitting there in the in the desert. All right, everything's okay without any water. Didn't this occur like in the second-ish year after Egypt? Very early in the... There is another story in Torah, and this is what makes it even more confusing, and you mentioned it, so right after the Jews left Egypt and they first come to the desert, they don't have water. That was before Miriam's well was introduced. At that time, God says, take your stick, ready for this one, and hit the rock. Moshe hit the rock and water came out 39 years earlier. So that happened in Exodus. 39 years later, they don't have water again because Miriam had, had passed away. That's a similar, we'll and Moshe, I mean, you can imagine, I did this once, it worked. You're telling me to take the staff again, and that would really show us, I think that really lines up well with the Abar Benel, who says that this is really a pretense for something else. Right. Why else would God say, I did see a beautiful interpretation on that once. Why would it be that the first time God were to say, hit the rock, and the second time not to? Because the first time when he hit the rock, it depends whether he had an audience or not. The second time he did have an audience, because remember, he was told to gather the elders. And first the time he also had an audience. He first time he had an audience, audience as well. Yeah. What about listening? You know, I keep thinking about those people who, with the rabbi, whose <coughs> students died because they did not listen. And so in many ways, the Moses not listen? You're saying just disobeying God's? Or just not even listening to what he had truly said yeah. because of the anger, I think that maybe too long. Well, Maimonides says it's it's anger. Rashi says it's hitting versus speaking. And my question here on Rashi, on the literal, is if speaking was good, if hitting was good enough the first time, what changed? One answer is that was, wasn't he? He wasn't told to do that second time. He should have listened. Because Moses, the first time, was talking to him of people that were in a state of Mitzrayim. Mm -hmm. Now, 40 years later, they are in a spiritual state. So it's a different way to communicate with people in a spiritual state versus a Mitzrayim state. Beautifully said. And I heard this perspective once. Let's go beyond the literal rock and water. In our own lives, we have a tough outside, right? And we're trying to extract the love inside, the heart inside. We do this with the kids. We do this when we discipline. There are some times, unfortunately, where there's no choice but to use, well, I don't know about anger, but to use force. There are times in life where you use force. 
And that's when you believe that there's no, there's no alternative. So hitting the rock to get out of the water would mean the Jews are, as you said, still tied up in the Egypt and the immorality of Egypt. They are a people that are, are still trapped by Egypt. And therefore, at that point in their journey, they had to be beaten, not literally. Uh, this is all a metaphor over here. But 39 years later, after 39 years of eating the manna and learning the Torah and having revelation at Sinai, and you've grown. Not that you're perfect, but you've grown. Now we can have a conversation. Now I should be able to speak to you to bring it out, not <coughs> hit you. So this is a, 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 a meaning on why maybe God gave different commands the two different times. And as a lesson to us, are there those times we jump too fast to discipline and not speak? Um, sure not yeah, but we need, because Moshe knew his people, sometimes you know your people so well, you don't see them growing up. You're still relating to them the way they were when they left. I heard a and again, you want to hear a neat proof for this idea? I'm not telling you proofs. Both times, have you heard this before, Hal? Both times God tells Moses to hit or to speak to the rock. But there's different words in Hebrew for rock. First time in Exodus, when Hashem says to hit the rock, this is shortly after the splitting of the sea, You should take the tzor. Tzor means rock. You ever hear the expression tzor Yisrael, the rock of Israel? Tzor means rock. In this case, it was a physical rock. All right. Tzor. In this week's Torah portion, Sela. Sela also means rock. Is that S-E-L-A-H? Yeah. S-E-L-A-H. Okay. I guess. In Hebrew, Samech, Lamed, Ayin. Samech, Lamed, Ayin. All right, those are the three Hebrew letters that make up the word Sela. Ready for this one? Take the middle letter of those three letters. Now, what I mean by that is Samech is the first letter in Sela. Spell Samech for me. We really need a PowerPoint over here. S A M. E-C-H. Okay. What's the middle letter of that in Mem. Hebrew? Mem. Mem. Good. Okay. So Samech's middle letter is? Mm. Mem. Mem. Okay. Hold that. What's the next one? Sela. Lamed. What's the middle letter of Lamed? Lamed. No, no. It is Lamed. Sela. S-E-L-A-H. Mem. 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 So we have Mem. Mem. And what did I say the last letter of Sela is? Ayin. What is the middle letter of ayin? Ya. Ya in Hebrew is ayin, ayud. Mem, mem, yud. What word in Hebrew is mem, yud, mem? Mayim. What does mayim mean in Hebrew? Water. Okay. So in other words, what is the, did you get that or not? Mem, yud, mem. No, is I'm transliterating. Okay, but the middle, the middle, the middle, I have to write it out. Yeah. If you take the word Sela, and this is, <coughs> we're all subject here, but it's fascinating. Sela, middle letter of each one, spells out the word water. In other words, the first time in Torah and Exodus, you were speaking to a rock that was hard. And the only way to get out its contents is? Break it. Break it. Later, the moisture is inside. These are people that have witnessed God at Sinai. They have the moisture inside. All you, the moisture is inside. The mem yud mem is hidden inside of them. All you have to do is bring it out. Moshe, are you still treating the people like the infant nation? You don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to do that anymore. <clears throat> Maybe that would be another reason he wasn't allowed entry into Israel in that it was not that it was a punishment. It was a sign that now that it's a new generation, they need a new leader. Moshe was so strongly identified with the nation that left Egypt for the good and for the bad. 
this was indicative that it was time for someone else. This this is another explanation that's not even given, but but it, it is interesting. Yeah. Is that the same cellar that's in some of the Psalms? Correct. Christ? There, cellar means like powerful. It's another expression for forever. My battery's low. Give me a moment to charge this. It means powerful. I've been trying to figure out exactly what it does mean. Because you know what you think of it, blessed be his name. Don't ask me. I have no idea why. I'm to. <laughs> okay. So we've had a few explanations. We have Maimonides that says it was mainly the anger. Rashi says he didn't listen to the instruction of speaking. Let's do one more. Nachmanides. Nachmanides rejects Maimonides. Go figure. <laughs> Nachmanides, the Ramban, does not like the interpretation of Maimonides, who says it was because of anger, and he actually is quite blunt about it. 15a. Yeah. He adds nonsense to nonsense. For the verse states, you defined my word, meaning that that, that had gone against God's words. <coughs> it states, you did not have faith in me, meaning that they did not have faith in God. The punishment was not because of anger. Furthermore, Aaron never grew angry in his life, for his way uh, one, was one of peace and composure. Maimonides, Nachmanides does not like making this about anger. Why? Because the verse doesn't say it's because you got angry. The verse says, because you didn't listen to what I said. It says, don't make this about something else, especially because Aaron, we know Aaron's personality was one of peace. Yeah. It occurs to me, we don't know what Moses was thinking. Yeah, we're talking from our... Yeah. So, so why don't you elaborate on that? Well, I mean, he's, I mean, he may have said, for example, you know, that, that, you know, maybe this way would be better. You know, right. You know? This is what, for some reason, he felt this is what the people needed to see. It's true. And I guess even there, we're saying that might be true, but he didn't listen. Right. Finally, this we is number... We don't know how conscious it was. Correct. We don't... And my, I, and maybe that is why Nachmanides doesn't like Maimonides. Maimonides says it was a moment of anger and he lost it. Nachmanides said, don't make it about that. Because if you're saying that, you're saying it was not conscience. You're saying it was not deliberate. It was not mindful. Maybe it was mindful. It just was not the correct path in hindsight. And Nachman said it from a point of anger, though. He said he adds nonsense to nonsense. <laughs> That's good. So... Nachmanides doesn't like Maimonides. What does he like? He prefers, and this will be the last, all oh, the second to last one will do. He prefers that of another rabbi whose name was Rabbeinu Hananel, who says something very different. The most plausible in all that was said is this, in this regard, is, which is a good rebuttal for questioners, are the words of Rabbeinu Mm -hmm. He wrote that the sin was that they said, can we draw water for you from this rock? They should have said instead, can God draw water? Mm -hmm. In the same way they had said, when God, God gave them the evening meat to eat, this left the possibility open for the people to think that Moses and Aaron, with their wisdom, could draw water from the rock. This is the meaning of the verse, you did not sanctify me in the midst of the children of Israel. When they said, you think we can draw water, we? We? You're messengers of God. It's not you. Especially with these people that could make the mistake in thinking, it was you. Um, so he writes, that was the problem. And that is why God says, you didn't sanctify me. You made this too much about your role here, not God's. So we have Nachmanides. And Rabbi Nachmanano that says it was the we, Rashi who says it wasn't listening, Maimonides who says it was anger, and Abarbanel who says it was really a pretense for something each of them did much earlier in their life. But to finish, and I think this is what the take home here is one last one, and this is a this is a basic midrash, and I don't know why this really predates the other interpretations that were given. But the Midrash writes, it wasn't the anger per se, there was a word in there. There was a word of Moses when he was talking to the Jewish people, 
that did not belong there. What is that word? Listen, you. What was the word? Rebels. Rebels. And let's... Why? What's wrong with that? Well, you know, I, you can just kind of tell he's tired. He's very tired, I think. You know, and it's kind of like the kids at the end of the day. When you kids say, you little monsters, go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit Listen, you rebels. In other words, the number one... <coughs> Number well, one, know. but a very important trait of a leader is to believe in the people. You need to believe in the people, and you need to believe that the people have faith. Even though time and time again they have shown that they don't, their faith is not always perfect. You need to believe they have faith. And this would go together with the opinion I said earlier, you need to believe the water is inside of them. They're not rebels. They have a confusing moment. They're afraid. They don't have water. That's okay. They are not rebels. That is what the Midrash shows. There was no uprising. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is not an uprising. And this, I think, feeds in very nicely to the other interpretation. Forty years earlier, they just came out of Egypt. That was a different story. These people have developed faith in God, on God. They're not an infant nation. You need to believe in your people. And I think the take-home for all of us over here is we all have times in life where we have a leadership position we got to believe in our children and believe in the people that we're talking to, even when the behavior doesn't always match up to it. Because we need to believe it is there. Um, the beautiful story when someone once was coming to the Rebbe, and they proudly told the Rebbe that they recently began a high holiday beginner service for children that have no background, no Jewish background. That was the words they used. So, Rebbe, aren't you? I, I want to. I'm sure it brings you a lot of nachas pride that you should know that in my town I started this beginner <coughs> service for Jews that do not have any background. And the Rebbe said, "What?" First of all, maybe the Rebbe didn't hear. He said it a second time. Those same words started a beginner's meaning for Jews that don't have any background. I didn't. The third time, and then the secretary's like, "No, that that there, it's not that the Rebbe didn't hear. The Rebbe wants to say something." The Rebbe says. Go back and tell them they have a background of the children of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, Rachel, uh, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. In other words, if you look at them like they have no background, they don't have a background. If you look at them that the neshama, the soul is inside, and it's just a matter of getting that water out, that's a different story. So that is our perspective. We need to look at children that way. Just this week, I was having a conversation with somebody. Yeah, my children, ah, yeah, they'll not... Don't say never. Don't say that. Don't say that. We don't say that. Don't say never. Right now it's not coming out. It's, it's not just children. It's, it's co-workers and colleagues. But that, 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 is, that, is, that is leadership. You have to believe in your people. Um, and, and this would be um, perhaps, again, one of the problems and one of the reasons, according to the Midrash, why Moshe wasn't able to lead them into the land of Israel because he had lost faith in them. And that doesn't make you able to be a leader when you're at that, that point. All right, so I think we will, we will hear it here. One other interesting tidbit about this is another time in history where there was a Jewish leader that lost faith in his people. And let me begin by saying at a Jewish circumcision, a bris, you have a chair of what? There's a chair of called Elijah's chair. Ko, uh, ki Seishel Eliyahu. What's Elijah have to do with a bris, a circumcision? I don't know. Why do we make a big deal? There's another time we also make a big deal with Elijah, and that is Pesah. So what's these two times? Why well, isn't it your Jewish identity? But, but why, where does Elijah come? I mean, there's a lot of, you know, Moshe's chair, Miriam's. Where does Eliyahu Anavi, Elijah the prophet, come in? So there's a story where Elijah the prophet will finish text 18, there's a time where he escaped to Mount Carmel. He got frustrated with the Jewish people. Text 18, we'll finish with this. Elijah escaped to Mount Carmel, as it says, and he arose and ate and drank, and he went. While he was there, God appeared to him. He said to him, Elijah, why are you here? He answered, I have been zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the children of Israel, have forsaken your covenant. I'm running away from them. I'm done. You know, I, 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 I'm here for your sake, God. So God said to them, 
God said to him, you are forever zealous. I swear that no circumcision will be performed until you see it with your eyes. This is why the sages instructed that a special chair be set aside for the angel of the brick, Elijah. You, you, you want to see the Jews' dedication to their religion? I'm going to make sure you're present spiritually at every single circumcision. And you will see, and similarly with Pesach, and how interesting is it that Ad Hayom Azen, until his very, I would say those are two of the traditions that Jews have hung on to, perhaps so much more than so many other things. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. These, these two areas, so don't give up on the Jew. and Don't give up, but this is really universal for all people. The same thing is, is true in the world that we live in. I think people often, because of violence, because of the media, because of horrible things that happened last week in Charleston or, or this week with the people running away from the prison. I mean, that's what everyone's talking about. They want us to believe that, you know, the average person, you hear so much about the bad, it's easy to give up on humanity. And it's not true. The av- I believe that the average person is a good person in this world, wants to do the right thing. Are there things that get in the way? Absolutely, there are things that get in the way. But it is important that we believe that. Now, we can't be gullible. We have to know that there are times, like we had in the Parsha, where you can't talk, unfortunately. You have to hit the rock, right? But most cases, the water is there. We just have to bring it out. And we can't lose sight of that and lose faith in that. We'll hold it there. Um, any questions, comments, online community? No. All right. Thank you for those that did tune in. I would love to hear from you if you are listening. Um, we'll be here, God willing, next week, next Tuesday, for the next session of Lunch and Learn. And again, a special thanks to Nissan Communication for making this possible for all our online viewers. Thank you and have a wonderful week. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Amnon Nissan, Health In with Debbie Brooke, Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Lessons of Vietnam with NCBVI members, The Tanya Love Show, Your Healthy Pet with Gisela DiCarlo. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it at www.nissancommunications.com Sponsored by Atomus.com Makers of quality video recorders and converters for professionals CarolinaApparel.com and DeltaForce.net